Hey everyone, it's August 17th, 2017. I am in Duluth, Minnesota, where I am reliably told that the ice is finally off the lakes and it's safe to go outside without a parka. But hey, why take chances? So I'm gonna stay right here in the Cirrus factory and we're gonna do a deep dive into how Cirrus builds airplanes here in Duluth. If you don't know this about airplane manufacturing, you should. Compared to cars, they have fewer parts but low volume complicates the process, so airplanes require a lot more hand production work than cars do. Like any airplane factory that hopes to be profitable, Cirrus is constantly looking for efficiency. Here's the company head of manufacturing, Rick Hollander. Uh, so the factory is set up in such a way that the uh, initial composite parts come in from Grand Forks on a weekly basis to satisfy the weekly demand. From there, they go into a climate controlled storage area uh, in our bond shop which then we produce uh, one airplane per tack time. Currently our tack time is about five hours. So every five hours the airplane's moving through a bonding station until it then goes into a body shop where we do body work and prep. Then we'll wheel out both the fuselage and the wing in a complete state to be uh, assembled in our mid-assembly area that you can see right behind me. And from the mid-assembly area that will then go to a paint at our new finishing center from the finishing center, it'll, it'll then come back with a almost customer-ready paint quality to go through our final assembly. At that point, we send it back over to flight test. It gets about three to five hours of flight test. We do a final paint, final detail, and then it's ready for the customer. So one of the biggest challenges we have right now with small volume is trying to find efficiencies in our system. Typically what we'll do is every two years we do a wall-to-wall -wall time study on all of the processes, which then allows us a couple of things. One, we're going to where the work's being done so we can see what's actually happening. Two, we're evaluating every employee, new or seasoned, to see how well they can react in that environment, which then gives us the opportunity to line balance. And the line balancing is really where we're finding a lot of the efficiencies that we can take out of the system, as well as create an equal work, an equal line flow for all employees, which then also take stress off the employees to allow for better quality as we go down the line. On, on the SR line, it is, it's minutes. It's, 30 minutes is definitely worthwhile. If you think about 30 minutes times 350 airplanes, that's a lot of time. So 30 minutes on the SR line is something that will go attack pretty aggressively. On the jet line, we're really in the, the two hour bucket type time frame at this point as we try to stabilize. Once it's stable and we've taken the variation out of the line, then we'll start looking at the one hour and the 30 minutes and really starting to attack. But today we're making one jet a week, 50 a year, two hours is a pretty good nugget. Uh, once we go to two a week, we're gonna wanna be a lot more aggressive. So uh, we absolutely reach a plateau. And, and if you think about the learning curve, uh, which, is, which is actually proven out, which was first founded in the aerospace industry, you've, you essentially remove efficiency at a certain level, call it 15%, 20%, every time you double production. So in theory, we've made 6,000 SRs. So if you use 15% efficiencies, we won't reach another 15% efficiency level until we make our 12,000th. So it's really hard, we really do hit the plateaus, but there's always room for improvement. And a lot of it comes right from the operators telling us, Rick, we ought to be doing this a little bit differently, and, and we go and do what they tell us to do differently. That's our job. When we visited Cirrus, the company was in the middle of reorganizing the entire production line to accommodate higher volume of the Cirrus Vision Jet, all without adding so much as a foot of extra floor space. Here's Rick Hollander again. So if we go back five years ago, we were making about uh, 275 SRs a year. Uh, fast forward to today, we're making um, 100 more SRs, so 350 this year, and our plans are to, to ramp to about 100 jets a year. Um, we didn't add any floor space to do that. So effectively, five years ago, this was all, I call it SR land. Um, and what we've been able to do through time, we talked about the time studies and how do we better flow the product. Um, we've been able to, to utilize the exact same floor space to effectively get 450 aircraft out the door. Through time, we've been able to morph into uh, kind of a mixed line of optimizing different areas. We're optimizing for a rate of 100 and we're optimizing for a rate of 350. Our sub-assemblies are optimized at a kind of a, a quasi batch process to where they're building seven or eight at a time and they deliver seven or eight and then they go on to the next process. 
You know, if you grew up in the 1960s, you probably remember putting together Ravel models and remember breaking off the parts from that little rack, gluing the halves together with the glue you weren't supposed to snip. Well, it sort of works like that here, but on a much larger scale. So let's take a look at how Cirrus puts all the parts together and bakes them in this big oven behind me. Uh, what you see here right now is the closing of a fuselage. They're bonding the two halves together uh, using an adhesive. After that, it'll go through a cure process for the adhesive to cure. So all the parts are manufactured in Grand Forks at our other facility and they're trucked over here. The first process for us would be to run it through a grit blast process to uh, abrade the surface to get it ready for bonding. And then they're pretty much ready for, to be put in the jigs and fixtures. After it comes out of the, the bonding fixture, it'll go through a trim and drill process where they'll trim out for windows, add other holes for it, uh, get it ready for the next processes down the line. Currently uh, on the SR side of it right now, we're at seven a week and we're gonna be ramping to eight a week. On the SF side right now, our attack time is one a week. In any kind of factory building a lot of anything, tooling is an essential part of the process. Well, this is tooling. Cirrus has a lot of it and it's a big investment. Automation in the form of robotic CNC machinery is common in most factories and there's a little bit of that going on here too. Here's Rob Neitzel to explain. So what you're looking at here is our uh, trim and drill robot. Um, it's a seven axis uh, robot used to trim large parts and assemblies. So. Um, Along with it, there's a large fixture that holds our wing uh, in the right spot so that the robot knows where to find it um, and can accurately locate the trimmed features and the, and the drilled holes. Robotics, the, the key drivers in our decision to go this route were reducing the cost of tooling and uh, providing more flexibility in our designs. So if, if we decide we want to move a hole over just a little bit, we can reprogram the robot versus retooling a, a hard steel fixture. While robotics clearly have a place in building airplanes, the real heavy lifting that Cirrus is done by human hands, a lot of hands, and that happens in this part of the factory, what Cirrus calls mid-assembly. Here's Jamie Schilling. So after the aircraft comes out of the composite areas in the body shop, it comes out to what we call here mid-assembly at Cirrus. Um, so what we do in mid-assembly is we have stations that we put a lot of the most of the components for the aircraft are put in in this stage so all the wire harnesses that go throughout the the interior of the cabin and the aft portion of the cabin as well as sub assemblies like the console get installed in our mid-assembly area uh, so in the sr mid-assembly uh, we do the same sorts of things we we put in a console we put in a lot of sub parts before the aircraft get painted the difference is we have a much shorter window to do that. So we move the plane every six hours right now in our, in our SR line, whereas we're doing it um, every four days in, in the SF line. So right, right now our, our tack time for, for an SR is seven SRs per week. So it breaks it down to every five and a half hours, we're building a station and moving the plane to the next station with the technicians moving, uh, moving the plane and then staying in that station and getting the next, next plane there. Um, on the SF side, that that tack time is a week long, um, looking to, to reduce that over time. So as, as you watch the SR production line, um, you'll see the technicians uh, installing all their components and then five hours later, it'll be moved to the next station in the production line. Uh, so you'll see a lot more, a lot more uh, items put on the airplane as, as the airplane moves down the production line. The minute assembly for the SR has six stations involved in that, so it's, it stays in there roughly one week. So after the mid-assembly stations on the SR side, we send it over to our paint facility and it's, it begins uh, looking pretty with our top coats. On the jet side, we send it to our final assembly line where we start with wing hang and putting the stabilizers on. Rick Hollander told me that the single most difficult part of building these airplanes is the paint job. It's not that the paint is hard to apply, but figuring out when perfect is getting in the way of good enough. If customers notice anything in their new airplanes, it's likely to be paint blemishes. Here's how Sears avoids that. So overall, the process for finishing a jet or a piston kind of is divided into two segments. There's what we call the paint segment and the detail segment. On the, on the paint side, we get it ready for paint and paint applied to it. 
some basic assembly, and then it goes over to our final and flight line in the main production building. Uh, after flight tests, it'll come back over here for final detail. Uh, any spot spray for damage or pain issues will be done, as well as sand and buff, and final finish, sealants, stripes, and getting it overall customer ready. The jet, we paint it over a weekend right now. We'll be looking to expand that to weekday shift as rate increases. Then it's ready to go back to the other side after some sand and buff and any inspections that are needed for it. And here a little detour before we finish up. Sears has orders for some 600 vision jets and that production had to be incorporated into a factory that hasn't been enlarged other than a new paint facility. Sears hopes to ramp up jet production to more than 100 airplanes a year and here's how they're going to do it. So right behind me is our final assembly line at Cirrus Aircraft for the SF-50 Vision Jet. This is the area where all the structural assemblies and the uh, sub-assemblies, bit assemblies come together and the piece parts are now ready to be assembled. The first station we have puts all of the components together. So this is the first time that the Vision Jet is together as one piece. Our stabilizers and our wing come together in this station. Then we move on to our next station where we rig the aircraft. So all of the control surfaces go on and go through their final rigging. Um, after that's done, we move forward to our uh, fairings and assembly area where the aircraft is packaged up. So everything's done now on the aircraft essentially and we're up to maintenance. So all of the fairings for the wing, uh, our cap system can go on and we're gonna be ready for paint as soon as it leaves that station, which is the next place that it goes. So right now, we're in the middle of a move. We're growing with both the Vision Jet and the SR line, and we need to optimize our space and optimize our flow. So we've learned a lot more about our Vision Jet and what it likes to go together and what it doesn't. And tomorrow, actually within 12 hours, we're gonna move this entire area and our SR area and reorganize it. With the move, we're going to um, improve on our, our rate. So our rate is uh, moving from um, half a unit to one unit, and we're going to continue to grow on and go from there. So we need to improve our flow. So this will optimize both the flow of the SR and the SF. Um, we have commonality between the two groups. That now that the SF-50 is mature or more mature, we're able to start capturing and improve the flow and reduce some waste time that we have in movement. By the time this line is reorganized and tuned to maximum efficiency, Sears says it will be capable of producing about 125 jets a year, or just over two a week. Like any other factory, Sears will let it mature for a while, and then a couple of years later, they'll reevaluate it, incorporate what they've learned, and start all over again. That's because, as Rick Hollander pointed out, successful manufacturing is a constant process of reinvention. We'll come back and take a look at it then. Meanwhile, thanks to Sears for giving us access to the factory and to the long-suffering Matt Bergwall, who's standing behind the camera there, following us around and making sure we get everything we need without getting in trouble. Thanks for watching.